I mean, I was just totally inspired this morning. But I want to spend a few minutes with you about accessibility. First, I want to mention if we're going to be talking about accessibility this morning, has anybody heard of this uh, hashtag accessibility? Let me move my uh, PowerPoint here. There we go. Ali, is I just know, A L uh, actually it's A one one Y. It is A N two ones and a Y. Accessibility, okay. And it's, there's 13 letters in accessibility. And in the social media world, they had to shorten it. So that's how we came up with Ali, okay. So, and then we had this hashtag. Ali. This is the sign language for hashtag. Okay. So if you're gonna be tweeting and posting today about accessibility, and if you notice in today's um, schedule, we have me talking about making the case for accessibility, and then at one o'clock we have Kim Smalley talking about accessibility. So if you're tweeting and posting about it, make sure you use the hashtag A. And it's number 11 or 11Y. One, one, so, and, um, and this is what I want to spend a few minutes with you. I have three points to make with you. But first, um, I have a quote that I want to share with you. Three points that I have to make. And it's good business, good design, and it's the right legal thing to do. And that's why I'm here to make my case. I'm a little bit thrown off here. My thought is not going the way I want. There we go. This is my favorite quote. Stock, stock, more stock. This is John Cronin. He's the owner of an e-commerce business. And is currently making $1 million. His mission in life is to make and generate happiness through the world of stock. If you go to his website, he sells all kinds of crazy stock. And if you look at him, he is a pretty special guy. And before we go further, I want to talk about the internet. Do you realize the internet is 29 years old? This man, Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet in 1989. Two years later, he launched the first website, 1991. And the purpose of that website was to share information with researchers. And we've been building websites ever since. He's also the director of the Worldwide Consortium, W3C, which is the Web Standards Organization. Now, this is the organization that specifies the technology, uh, the guidelines, all the things that make the web perform. He also believes that the web has a purpose for the humankind. This is the quote that he said around 2006. The power of the web is in its universality, access by everyone, regardless of its disability, is the essential aspect. Today, websites are pretty much indispensable, pretty much. Just like we are with our smartphone. We can't imagine being without our smartphone, right? Every day we get up, we go to our computer, right? And we go out and maybe we go check out the news, check the weather. Maybe we go on the website, on the computer, look for information, look up a company, look at a product. When was the last time any of you looked up the yellow pages? I mean, really? When was the last time you opened up an encyclopedia? We go to the website to go shopping. I mean, look what happened look where Amazon is today. But we support small e-commerce businesses as well. So we go shopping. 
We build communities through websites, right? Car membership sites, forms. So websites today are indispensable. But what if you can't access it? What if you can't do something with some websites? That's what I want to talk about. And I don't know if these links are going to work or not, but I have some examples of links here where there are some obstacles. The first link up there is a podcast. I'm reading a book right now by Michael Hyatt. I'm not trying to pick on anybody here. You have to understand that. The Best Year Ever by Michael Hyatt. And he thought that he would try to provide some supporting material to go along with his book, with podcasts. They're great, love it. Except, I can't hear them. They're not transcribed. The next one, I make my living supporting clients with the social media. I'm always looking for tools and resources to advance my knowledge so I can help better serve my clients. So I'm looking for educational resources. So this happens to be a webinar on how to provide social media support for business to business clients. The problem, the webinar is not captioned because I can't hear what the speaker said. There's not even a side video where I can look for it. And the last one is Atlantis History Center for Careers. This has to do with a screen reader, an online job application. Now, it doesn't pertain to me, but it pertains to a person who's visually impaired or maybe has a mobile challenge. You click on that website, instead of going to directly to an online job application, there's a pop-up. There's another step that they have to go to. And if you're visually impaired or you have a mobile challenge, it's an obstacle. So, here's what I want to do. I want to try a little experiment. Now, I don't want to freak anybody out or make anybody uncomfortable. I'm going to share with you what I want to do. What I want to do, I want to say, I bet in this room, and if you're willing to try this, it's just a little experiment, okay? I'm going to list off some disabilities. And after I've listed them, we can stand up, okay? But after I list them, okay? So here, and I bet that after I've listed them, there's about 15, maybe 12% of the people in this room that have some sort of disability, okay? You willing to try it? All right, here we go. Now I have to hold on to this because there's quite a bit of um, disability to listen here. And by the way, I have three of them that I'm about to list. All right, here we go. And I'm trying to make sure I can read them. I'm wearing my glasses, that's one of them. All right, here we go. Here's my lips. Can you not see at all? You wear glasses. Do you have color blindness? Are you deaf? Do you consider yourself hard of hearing? Do you have trouble hearing in certain situations? Do you have a mobility challenge? Do you have carpal syndrome? Have you ever had an arm or leg in a cast for more than two days or for two weeks? Do you suffer from migraines? Do you live most of your day in a wheelchair? Do you have an attention deficit disorder? Do you have obsessive compulsive disorder? Are you bored with this list? 
How about autism? Do some letters look upside down or backwards to you? Was English not your first language you learned? Nah, I think I'm gonna stop here. There's a lot that's going on here, but okay, I think I'm gonna stop right here. How about now you can stand up? Stand up if you have any of those disabilities that I have listed in here. Okay, stand up. There you stand up. Now I want you to look to your left. Look to your right. Look behind you. Okay. This is who, who you are designing for. Designing your website for. This is who we are writing for. This is who we are podcasting and doing webinars for. Look at We are all wonderful, fantastic people that we are doing this for. Thank you very much, Sit down. You may sit down. Do you get it? This is what I'm trying to say. We're now doing these things for some person, no, multiple person is hiding some little hole somewhere. We're doing this for everybody. We're doing it for people who are like us. And that's what I'm trying, the point that I'm trying to make. Okay. There we go. So what forms of disability are we talking about here? So three kinds actually. We have permanent, episodic, and temporary. And I have some up here. Now I know I'm generalizing when I'm saying that. When people think of disability, they think of the permanent ones. Whoop, sorry. Uh, Blind, deaf, artistic, cerebral palsy, or maybe someone with an accident that paralyzed in the wheelchair. Then those episodic ones. Episodic are short term disabilities. Did you know that cancer is considered an episodic disability? Migraines falls in that category. Epilepsy, asthma, those are episodic disabilities. Episodic disability is defined, and if I read it correctly, it says here, having a long-term condition that is characterized by periods of good health, interrupted by periods of illness or disability. The period may vary in severity, length, and predictability. So that's what episodic disability is. And then lastly, temporary. Now, I'm sure that some of you out here maybe have had to wear a patch because of a lazy eye. Maybe a book on a bone, an arm, leg, and it happened to be your dominant arm or leg, right? Now, what if you had to move, try to move a right? Have you ever tried moving a mouse with an arm that wasn't your dominant arm? Pretty difficult. And let's change the scenario a little bit. Let's pretend you're traveling at a bus or a train and you forgot your earphones. And you want to listen to maybe a podcast or a video on your pad or your smartphone. I know, and I will hear you, the train or bus can be pretty noisy. So you have two choices. You gotta turn up the volume on your smartphone, your iPad, so you can hear it. Or you can go like this and look like a fool, right? But what if we were capturing or transcribed? But let me point something out here that I haven't mentioned. Each of us may experience disability in our lifetime. Temporary, episodic, permanent comes from maybe when we're older. Or I gotta get old. Okay. I hear you sort of fair. I say sort of fair. 
Okay, so let's not forget that. Today, there are about 650 billion, I forgot that word, people in the world that have disability, or that's about 10% of the population. In the United States, 12% of the population have disability. Now, someone had asked me this question. Is there a way that you can tell if someone came to my website if they have a disability? My answer is no. Just look at these statistics. It could equate to one in five people in the United States that have some form of disability. So you can look at it that way that you are potentially ignoring or creating obstacles for that are coming to your website. That that could be the way you could look at it. The only place you would know if somebody has a disability, believe it or not, is when you go to fill out a job application. Have you ever noticed that? You have to fill out if you have some sort of disability. The government keeping track of you that way. All right, so here we are. I want to talk about the good business, reasons why we need to have accessibility. I'm ready to make my points. It's more of a social responsibility. I want to say that we, bring creativity, talent, and unique perspective. If you want to bring us into your company, we are a resource as a, as a workforce. So if you want to retain and attract the best people in your organization, I mean, wouldn't you want maybe another Stephen Hawkins in your organization? Maybe another Gavin uh, Gurma? You want to make sure that your website is accessible. And we are also wage earners. There are 30 percent of us out there in the population that are white collar workers. And if we look up white collar workers, the definition of what that means for professional, professional workers earning pretty good income, and that equates to pretty good income, and we have money to spend. In the 2015 report out there that shows that we have money to spend in the travel industry. We are tech savvy, and I can vouch for that. When I heard about, when I was in high school, now I won't give away my age here. In high school, things were different back then. And when I graduated from high school, when the Mac first came out, the iMac, it was probably about the size, a little bit bigger than this little mini iPad that I'm holding. I remember eyeing it like it was my future, and it was. And I went after that iMac because I knew it opened up the world for me, because that's when the world was starting to take off. And then the internet, email and text messaging started to take off at that point. I was the first one texting and emailing with my family members. Today, I make my living digitally. I talk on my phone through voice over IP, and my phone translates my conversations with people through a capture, captioning on a screen that would not have been made, made possible if it was not for technology. I love video conferencing because I can read lips with my clients. Where would we be without technology? And for a lot of us who have disabilities, we are usually the first adopters because we can see how it can open doors for us. So we are the first adopters of technology. And if we see as a company, if you're a company or an organization that supports inclusion and diversity, 
you will gain our loyalty from not just from us, but from our family members. And we will support you. And we will, you will have our diehard loyalty. Then there's a statistic that shows that 15% of the disabled are entrepreneurs. The majority of them run a home-based business. And they are self-taught like most of us. All of us are self-taught, just like you are, just like me. And we're always looking for ways to grow, to be better, and to be able to be more successful. And the other segment is that there are the increasing population of the older people, just like I mentioned. We can't ignore them as well. The hearings are going, the eyesight is going, and the medication. I can remember my father, who, when he has to take medication to control his blood pressure or whatnot, that made his hand tremble so bad. That is a mobility challenge. So we cannot ignore that. They are becoming the largest website users. So that, I believe, I've made my point that it's a good business reason to have your website accessible. Otherwise, you're losing money and you're losing uh, people in your organization. Good to dying. Okay, now good to dying is the other part that I want to make. Now, the other reason why we want to make accessibility is Google search engine, Yahoo search engine, Bing search engine all have a learning capability of a four year old. And if we design a website for assistive technology, think about that. We will make it easier for Google, Bing, and Yahoo to pull up in those two things because they will pick up know what they're looking for. And you will rank higher in the two things ranking because your website is organized and labeled properly for the assistive technologies. I'll get into that later. Melanie Edcock, who's speaking tomorrow at 9 a.m., will explain that a little bit. So make sure you have her on that, uh, your agenda tomorrow. Another way to look at this, if you offer transcription for your webinar and podcast, it will also help your website search up higher in the search function ranking. And your search function will also be able to pull up your podcast a lot faster than just little things. That's why I notice when I go to a podcast website, they just list the bullet points, but that's all it's going to pull. You're missing out the opportunities if you put the tra transcript of the podcast in there for search engine to pull up more of the keywords that are in there about your podcast or your webinar. And there's another one more point to make about that. What if they're reading about it and they see a quote or verse or something in there that they really like that resonates with them? You know what they're going to do with it? They're going to capture that and they're going to highlight it and they're going to pull it and they're going to tweet it and they're going to post it. And then they'll refer back to you. What a great way to get back to you in the social media world. Bada bing, bada boom. There's the way. Now, that's the other way. The transcript would be a great benefit for your website. Another point that I want to make about speed and efficiency. When we're designing your website for accessibility, we're thinking about user experience. We all know that user experience comes from user accessibility. 
I'm telling you, you should better do a to die, not die. We all know that good web sites design come from good user experience. So that comes down to well again, well organized web sites. And Melanie will explain this when you go to a session Sunday and at nine AM. And I'm not um, the purpose of my piece here today is not technology. But when I'm talking about user ability to die, is that when you're thinking about assistive technology and how they work, you are going to be thinking a little bit more about user experience. And when you remove the barriers away within your website, you are actually creating a better user experience. Therefore, it comes down to making uh, your website much more efficient and then it increases the speed of your website as well. And then at the end, you get savings. So your website won't need as much as the uh, server capacity that it would need. So you save money that way. And the last point here, you won't need it for a lawsuit either. And here's a quote from Haben Goma who is a deaf and blind lawyer. She's also a speaker, advocate for disability rights. And she says, disability is never the barrier. Barriers are society. The obstacles are the people. Create, and it's up to all of us to practice inclusion. Now, if you can YouTube her and find her Facebook, she actually shares her experience trying to go shopping on e-commerce, and how much of it is the frustration for her to go shopping. Uh, this is the one last point, and this is the one real reason why I'm talking about this topic. It's the legal, right. I'm going to be showing links here from our United States government, the ADA and Section 508. The ADA stands for American with Disability Act, which was signed in 1990. It is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination based on disability. Now, I know that some people think, well, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with buildings. It has to do with infrastructure, sidewalks, and making sure of ramps are uh, accessible for the disability, but that's not the case. If we read it a little bit more further, there was an interpretation, and it came to there's some cases that made it that websites are now defined as a public, and that's the word that they use, a public accommodation. And again, it's based on whoever's making the determination. So now they say any it's considered a public accommodation, and that includes websites. Uh, again, it applies to whoever is making the determination. Section 508 compliance is an amendment to the United States Workforce Rehabilitation Act of 1973. It's a federal law mandating all electronic and information technology developed, procured, maintained, or used by the federal government be accessible to people with disabilities. Now, this pertains to schools, colleges, and any businesses that does business with the government. So if you're collecting money from Medicare, your business collects money from Medicare, that equates to that. If you're a nonprofit entity collecting money from the government, that equates to that. You're not off the hook. I'm going to show you some businesses that have been sued for not having non-accessible websites. 
and a pretty renowned business judge, Wynne Dixie, the grocery store. They were ordered to conform because the website was not accessible for screen reader. Target, same thing. They were ordered to conform because the website was not accessible for a screen reader to read. Happy Lobby. Uh, they may be set out of court. Same reason. Screen reader could not read the website. Olive Garden, the online menu. Same reason. Maybe set it out of court. But, oh, I'm sorry, during an appeal, the screen reader could not read the online menu. Five guys. They were stood because of the menu. But the case was dropped because they agreed to make the amendments. Blick, the art supply. They were stood for the same reason, dropped, because they agreed to make the changes. America Financial Bank, online banking, they're being stood because the online banking is not acceptable for the blind and the visually impaired. And the last one, bags and baggage. The online job application in a festival. Few is often described as false evidence appearing real. But this is a guy who may not have anything to do with what I'm talking about here. And I'm not here to scare you. I'm here just to make a point. I'm here to say, look, you may think, oh, I belong to you know, the government and school, it doesn't pertain to me. I'm here to say, no. I'm here to say that it applies to all of us, regardless. Because we're all in this together, just like what Amy said this morning, right? We're all a team, we're all a family, we're all a community. WordPress community earlier this week even the staff said they made an announcement, a commitment to make WordPress as inclusive and accessible as possible. And there's a link. And a commitment for proof. They just announced it this week and they're forming a team. So where you can go from here, we can learn more. So those, after uh, one o'clock today, Kim Camp Smalley, and then tomorrow, uh, uh, nine o'clock in the morning, listen to uh, Melanie Edcock. Uh, so, the good news is, there's a lot of good things to learn. We learn a whole lot of time, whether or not you know a lot about accessibility. If you know a little about accessibility, that's fine. But this is the perfect time to learn about it. It's never been easier. And with WordPress behind us, we're ready. We can do it. We can be part of the team. The understanding become better, the software is better, the hardware is better, the assistive technology should become available. And if you don't know what assistive technology is, the screen reader is one of them. Now, in order to design well for disability, we need to understand what we're grappling with. We all have all these wonderful things that we've invented to overcome these challenges. We call these assistive technologies, and by understanding them, we know how to best write or to dying for them. I'm just going to mention a few of them. I've been talking about screen readers. The screen reader is a software that works with the blind or the visually impaired. That reads the text that's displayed on the computer or onto a braille. Then we have captioning and transcribed text. And then the picture that you see here is called a stiff puff device, it's the head device, it's for those that have uh, paralyzed from the neck down, pretty much. 
And when they move around, it's basically moving around on the monitor on the computer, it's like a mouse, okay? And then when they pop, it's like clicking on the mouse. But that's how that thing works. And if you design your website properly with guidelines that are available, she will be able to start and move around on the website. But if you don't, she can't. And that's the whole point of it. So what you need to know is the WCAG 2.0 guidelines. And I have a link where you can go. My PowerPoint's available, will be available through uh, the WordCamp website. And you can go to this website, and again, the WordPress community is sharing this link as well on the handbook. And this is a standard that everybody abides by. There's level A and level two. And you will hear Kim Smalley talk about it, you will hear Melanie talk about it. There are 38 levels that we have to try to achieve. Okay? If you achieve level A, then you can say, I have a level A web accessible website. If you achieve a level two, you can say, I have a level two accessible website. But there are 38 no rules, as we call them, or standards. In an example of a level A, for example, I put it up there, it's using alternative tests with your images. Now, I think most of us know what alternative tests is, but there are specific ways that we need to use an alternative tests, especially when it comes to screen readers. And again, you hear Kim and Melanie talk about it. Level two is to make all functionality available from a keyboard. Now that's the channel. You have to make sure that you can move around a website without the use of a mouse. That's level two. All right, I think that wraps me up. I think you can see I'm pretty passionate about this topic, and I also want to say one more thing before I wrap this up. I want to thank the World Camp organizers for picking this topic, the theme, creative diversity, creative diversity, 